Keane. I'm a junior research fellow at Homerton College, the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. I work on science for children in the 19th century and one of the things I've been working on recently is fairy tales and science. And here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation we've got some wonderful examples of how fairies and chemistry came together in the late 19th century to introduce a whole wonderful world to new childish audiences. Science is really exciting in Victorian Britain. There's new monsters, that we would call dinosaurs, people are digging up all around the country. There's new colours such as mauve, which has never existed before. There's new machines all around. Those railway trains, they weren't there. And what do people think this is like? This is a new source of wonder. Things that have previously only been found in stories, things that have been in fantastical tales about the universe, can now be found all around you in your everyday life. So now science everyone is saying, is the real source of wonder. Fairies and fairy tales were combined with science in different ways by different authors. So for the author of this book, Arabella Buckley, who wrote The Fairy Land of Science in 1879, fairies were equated with forces. Fairies really did the invisible work in nature. Buckley's book had first been presented as a series of lectures to children in St John's Wood in London the year before. And in 1879, she put them together into this work. She took the seemingly everyday objects, such as a drop of water on its travels, or a sunbeam, or a bee, or a lump of coal, and she revealed them to be filled with wonderful stories, with wonderful powers and processes. She asked her readers to imagine how you could enter the fairyland of science. But what she really wanted to tell them is that they were already there. What they had to do was open their eyes to the wonders of the world that surrounded them. How could they open those eyes? Well, for Buckley, it was through learning the scientific processes at work every day all around them. Other authors used different strategies to bring fairyland and science together. For the author of this book, Fairy Frisket or Peeps at Insect Life, the author took the fairy and made it a guide to nature. Another work we have on the shelf here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation is Real Fairy Folks, or The Fairy Land of Chemistry. Now, this book has the most wonderful illustrations, which you can see a great example of here. This work used fairies in yet a different way. In particular, we can see through its pictures, it used it as a way of illustrating how chemical bonding worked. So this very much drew on contemporary fascination with the fairies in the late 19th centuries. Fairy was fairyland and fairies were so incredibly popular. This is when we see all kinds of new stories being written and everything from ballets to bars of soap being named after fairies and being placed in fairyland. This is actually a picture of a water molecule if you see, we have oxygen in the centre and she's holding hands with two hydrogen atoms to create the H2O molecule that we know is water around us every day. So where is Buckley in the fairy land of science about 10 years earlier had talked about water as one of these marvellous everyday substances that you could follow throughout its life cycle subject to invisible fairy forces. By the time we get to this work, the fairies are used to show water itself in line with lots of current pictures of what they thought fairies looked like with their flowing gowns and illuminated headdresses. So Charles Dickens, the Victorian novelist, once created a character called Mr. Gradgrind. And Mr. Gradgrind said that facts alone are wanted in life. And I think people have tended to believe Mr. Gradgrind when it comes to 19th century children's science books. They think they're all really boring and crammed full of facts. I think when we peer a bit closer at these works, we can see that they're really not those dry textbooks at all. In fact, 
what 19th century authors tried to do was to make science instructive and amusing. How they made science instructive and amusing took various different forms, from conversations to letters to the use of toy sets, all kinds of things. In these few examples here, we see how fairies and fairyland were brought in to this melting pot of facts and fancy that brought education and entertainment together for childish audiences. And one of the points these authors tried to make was that truth was stranger than fiction. The true stories they had to tell about the marvellous world around you was a much better form of storytelling. Those facts weren't so dry. In fact, facts were the most fantastical of all.